So I'll just go ahead and get started as they, uh, they come up here. I'm going to talk about gold, non, not surprisingly, and, um, and I realize I'm going to be preaching to the choir here. So if you feel a hallelujah come up, just please let it out, let it out. Don't be restrained at all. We're all, uh, we're all seeing the same script here, I believe. Uh, if there are any bears on gold in the audience, you want to raise your hands or not? Uh, probably not. Um, the new gold bull market, why it's here and what you need to do about it. Uh, I look at this as being an inevitability. I think the higher gold prices are inevitable. If you look at the bigger picture, and I'm going to look at that bigger picture, and then I'll drill down a little bit. But there's one primary overriding reason why higher gold prices are inevitable. And it has to do with the answer to this question. What's the most consistent, powerful bull market in the history of finance? Anybody care to guess? Um, I know some of you probably saw my last presentation, so know it, so be quiet, Bill. Um, this is it. Federal debt. Federal debt has been growing at a trend line growth rate since 1900 of 8.7377% annually. Now, if only we could invest in any security that would return that over time. We talk about the federal debt now, $22.7 trillion. How large that is? Well, consider that it's going to be $25 trillion by basically the end of this year at this growth rate. In a couple of years, it'll be $30 trillion. This thing grows and it compounds, and it's not slowing down because they're back. Trillion dollar deficits. You know, people have this, or in the U.S., we have this perception that a Republican administration is much more cost conscious than a Democratic administration. Uh, it's not true. Either one, both of them, no matter which side of the aisle they're on, they spend, spend, spend. It's, a, it's, it's guaranteeing your job security. It's, uh, the swamp cannot be drained. So even Trump, who campaigned on cutting uh, spending, once they're in office, they, they, they write the checks. So we're back to trillion dollar deficits, thereabouts. And that's not the, the end of the story because a trillion dollar deficit means functionally that the federal debt increases by about 1.4 to 1.5 trillion every year. That's because there's about 500, 400, 500 billion dollars every year that's on autopilot, that's off budget. Uh, things like Social Security, et cetera. That spending is added to the, to the debt, but it doesn't show up in the deficit. So that's why they talk about a trillion dollar deficit is so bad, but then you look at the end of the year and the debt is about one and a half trillion dollars higher. That's why we're gonna be at about 25 trillion uh, around the end of this year and, and again, 30 trillion within a couple of years. Now this, uh, this chart is corrupted. It uh, shows you how, that the federal debt process is so corrupt that it even corrupted this chart. Um, <laughs> but you can probably see those three blips. The first one is, if it was turned correctly, you could see it going from left to right, is World War I, second one is World War II. And the last one is basically after they cut the dollar's tie to gold, then central bankers were uh, able to spend without any restraint. It was like uh, giving, uh, uh, giving a bottle of whiskey and car keys to a teenager. Uh, and then the federal, as soon as they got that freedom, they went and drove the car into the ditch, and that was the 1970s. But after that, they started just spending and spending. Well, with every economic slowdown, they would lower interest rates and provide liquidity to the market. And then in the next slowdown, the next recession, they would have to provide more liquidity. Uh, lower rates even more because the patient need, had become tolerant to the drug and needed more and more and more. And that uh, leads to the process we find ourselves in today. Now, what are the implications of this debt load? Uh, well, throughout history, there are uh, only a few ways that you can get out of, of large debt loads. An economy can grow its way out of it. You can collect more taxes. And, and or you can uh, cut spending. We know that the, we, the debt's too large now to grow way out of it. Uh, they can't collect much more in taxes about cratering the economy. 
They're certainly not going to cut spending. So the age-old recipe, and this has gone on throughout time, throughout millennia, through civilization after civilization, the age-old recipe, the, the, the one solution is to depreciate the currency in which the debt is denominated. Uh, that's what's going to happen. Now, there's another implication here, and this chart shows this. Debt costs are exploding. If you have any kind, debt service costs explode, if you have any kind of a real interest rate. So I want to show uh, this in a little bit more detail. If you look at the, uh, the blue line is federal debt. Now, the red line is federal government interest expenses. Now, if you notice, uh, after the 2008 credit crisis, we saw federal debt and spending just soar. But interest expenses basically were, were flat, back and forth, but they, they were kind of range-bound. And that was because while the debt was soaring, while the Fed was, um, uh, or actually while the government was going through stimulus programs and, and et cetera, and exploding the debt, the Fed was lowering the interest rate toward zero. So the debt service costs were basically flat. Now what happened here is this is the first Fed rate hike. And if you remember, that was from zero, basically zero to a quarter point, one quarter point rate hike. And what happened was interest expenses started to soar. That's the kind of leverage we have when the debt is so large right now. A very small increase in interest rates leads to a very large end result in debt service costs. And remember, the first three years, they were raising rates only a quarter point a year. And yet, the service costs soared to over $600 billion. Now, I've, I've looked at what would happen. For example, the Fed was trying to get up to a 3% level on the, Fed, on the uh, Fed funds rate. If they were going to get to that rate, the actual debt service costs, if you divide interest expense by the government, by the federal debt, it's usually about 3% or so above the Fed funds rate, believe it or not. Uh, so that would have implied, if they got to 3% on the Fed funds rate, that the debt service, the annual debt service, would have approached a trillion dollars. And there's no way that that would be politically possible in today's day and age. Um, at that point, people start banning terms like uh, debt jubilee, forgiveness of debt, et cetera. If and when that happens, if they talk about why are we paying so much money to all these fat cat investors, why are we paying this interest on the debt, why are we saddling our kids with this, these expenses that they had nothing to do with, then you will see the, uh, the, the dollar basically crater, the value of the dollar in the international markets. So the new reality now is that we can't have anything approaching normalized interest rates. The federal debt's so large that service costs are crushing at anything above the rate of inflation. In other words, if you have a positive real rate of interest on the debt, then the, 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 the federal budget is cratered. So ultra-low to negative real rates are not only likely at this point, but they're absolutely necessary. Now, this is enormously bullish for precious metals, for gold and silver, and it's going to be the new reality for years to come. The good thing for us in this room is that gold loves negative rates. This, comes, this chart comes from our good friends at Incrementum who do the In Gold We Trust report, which is, I think, the best report on gold annually. And as you, if you can see, the blue shaded areas are, are periods of time in which negative interest rates were largely in effect. And this gold line is the gold price. So as you can see, when negative interest rates kind of uh, are pretty much are in effect, then it has a very bullish effect on gold prices. This, of course, is because gold doesn't pay any interest and it actually has a carrying cost. So what we're looking at here is uh, ba basically negative interest rates because of our debt loads uh, for the foreseeable future, frankly, forever under this current monetary regime. So gold began this next leg up. You know, we look at December 2015 as the bottom of the market, and we've had a couple of bursts up and down since then, a couple of rallies here and there, but it's basically been a sideways consolidation recovery. But gold really turned the next leg up 
when the Fed returned to its proven recipe, and that recipe has two steps to it. Step one, cut rates. And this goes back to what I mentioned a minute ago, in that once the Fed, Federal Reserve was no longer restrained by a tie to the gold price, the Fed was able to monetize the debt and actually encourage the debt and do basically Congress's bidding by, by monetizing the debt. But in every downturn, after the 1970s, they went, they're, they're, for one thing, the 70s, the only thing that turned that around was Volcker, and there's not been another Volcker since then, and I don't think there will be. Somebody with that kind of iron will to raise rates and basically crater the economy to stop inflation. I don't think we're ever going to see that again. What we have seen is that in every recession after that period, the Fed lowered the Fed funds rate. They lowered interest rates. This is a chart of the Fed funds rate. You can see the bottoms. This is after the 1981 recession. This is after an economic slowdown, but not much of a recession. You can see that in every economic slowdown, they lowered rates, but they never got to the levels before. It's been a stair step down to the point where, after the 2008 credit crisis, we were basically at zero for years and years. And now we started, this is their attempt at the very end there to normalize rates, and then they catered to the whims of Wall Street and started to cut rates again. Where will they end? Somewhere around here, if this pattern remains. In other words, you're looking at, say, uh, the 10-year Treasury at a negative rate in the next downturn. Again, this is a, uh, a representation of the fact that in every successive slowdown, the patient demands more, more, more. It's like more cowbell, more cowbell. They want lower rates. They want more money, and in the 2008 crisis, they not only lowered rates, they resorted to quantitative easing. So what's step two in the recipe? QE. And that's where we are now, but don't call it QE. Now, they will assure you that what they're doing right now is not quantitative easing. Uh, uh, ben Bernanke, in January of 2009, I highlighted this in one of my recent newsletters, gave a speech in which he assured the public that what they were doing was not quantitative easing, as in the uh, Bank of Japan had been doing for years. Uh, four years later, four and a half trillion dollars added to the Fed balance sheet, three rounds of quantitative easing, it was quantitative easing. What we're living through now is QE4. The, uh, the Fed tried to unwind its bloated balance sheet for two years, and that unwind was a total of $679 billion that they erased from the balance sheet over two years. Since the, uh, the end of August, basically since the beginning of September, over 57% of that two years of tightening has already been erased. And this does not include those emergency slash permanent repo operations that they're doing right now as well. We are in QE once again. We will look back at some point and call this QE4. So the bottom line is a new gold bull market is in progress. The long-term picture is clear. These are inevitable trends. This is the big picture. We're going to have fluctuations in the short term. But keep your eye on the horizon. Keep your eye on the big picture. Keep your eye on this inevitability of what's happened over and over throughout human history. Again, the long-term picture is obvious. The short-term, actually, is exciting, in my view. Let's look at what's happened to gold since uh, basically the beginning or mid middle of December. I was predicting all throughout the fall that we would have a gold price rally, a New Year rally, beginning around the second half of December. It wasn't exactly a bold call. It had happened four years before. Uh, Every year since December of 2015, I've been predicting this, and it's happened. Uh, this one was easy. So what happened was we started about December 20th off those lows, and gold actually gained about 4% from then through the end of the year. We had a really nice rally in gold. It kept up the first day, January 2nd. Everybody got back to work. We had a nice, I believe, 8 or $10 rally in the gold price. Then the missiles began to fly. And I got out alerts to my readers. I was on Twitter saying, this is dangerous. 
Uh, geopolitical issues are not what you want driving the gold price. We had gotten to a point where the public was just starting to understand the really fundamental monetary reasons for higher gold prices. And my view is that this geopolitical dust up ran the risk of temporarily derailing that rally. Uh, and it did. It, uh, you know, gold spiked. It actually got over $1,600 on an intraday basis when Iran was uh, planning or enacting its counterattack. And then we had a big drop. But this is the interesting thing to me. If you see the drop, we didn't give back all of the gains that we gained on that geopolitical issue. So the fundamental monetary issues, that rally was still in the background. It was still working. Uh, this is a sign to me that we are really in a bullish environment for gold. Another thing that's been very negative for gold for two years has been the China trade deal. The market has interpreted that as being, or any resolution to that as being very bearish, to the point where I thought if the U.S. and China signed a deal, gold would probably, lo probably lose about $100 an ounce. They signed the deal earlier this week, and gold gained $10 on the day. My point here is that we are in a bull market because when the market interprets all data bullishly, we even probably, even what was deemed bearish news, when they interpret even bearish news bullishly, it's a bull market. When investors are looking for excuses to buy and not reasons to sell, it's a bull market. So the feeling right now is that we're in a bull market. Now, I am not a technical analyst like Jordan is, but I've never been one to let ignorance prevent me from offering an informed opinion, so I'll go ahead with it anyway. Uh, there's just a couple of things that I look at on a technical basis that throughout my many years in the market have proven uh, beneficial to me. And I get my charts from Ron Grease at thechartstore.com. Really recommend his service. His weekly chart blog is, is exceptional. But what he outlined here is a flag pattern you can see. This was that four month or so uh, uh, correction that we had from about August uh, through early December. As you can see, we broke through that pretty decisively, which is a bullish sign. I like to follow these 14 week stochastics because this is a, this is a sign of uh, momentum in the market. And uh, as you can see, back in the early 2000s, gold would spend a lot of time over 80 on the stochastic. That's what you want, sustained uptrends, uh, sustained upward momentum. And typically, the bottoms are very sharp, except for some of these really bad times around 2012, 2013. This cycle from top to bottom, even if gold doesn't spend much time in the uh, over 80, typically takes about six months to work from uh, in full, the full cycle. We're about halfway back up. This kind of implies that we have another couple of months at least, even if gold doesn't spend much time in that positive area. So this tells me we're in a bull bullish uptrend, we have positive upward momentum, probably going to last at least a couple of months. Same story in, in silver, uh, unsurprisingly, in the same position. Now let's look at what the upside represents. What's the real inflation adjusted peaks in the gold price? As you can see, this price back here, this was a nominal price record of $850 in January of 1980. Today's dollars, that's about $2,800. So if we get to a situation that kind of feels like the late 1970s again, we're going to have $3,000 gold or thereabouts. Even the $1,920 record in uh, 2011 is now equivalent to about $2,144. So silver is a w another way to play this, another good sign that you're in a classic bull market, one that's longer term, sustained, based on monetary issues, is when silver outperforms gold. As you can see, these are all instances where the gold-silver ratio was falling. Silver was outperforming gold, therefore, or it indicates here that we were in, if you can extend these up, they, they uh, correspond to uptrends in the gold price. We're in that position right now. Now let's look at the upside. If we get back to the 1980 record in current dollars, that's about an 86% rise from today's levels. 
if you look at getting back to the 2011 peak, that's another 42% in real terms from today's levels. These would also obviously correspond to tremendous gains in the junior mining stocks. For silver, the upside is huger. To get back to the 1980 high, that would equate to $158. That's a nine times multiple from today's price. Just to the 2011 peak, that's a three times multiple. So that's another great way to play it, get leverage on gold, is through silver. And I'm right on time, amazingly. This is me, Gold Newsletter, New Orleans Investment Conference, another wonderful event. Uh, it's October 14th to 17th. Follow me on Twitter. Come listen to my, my podcast. I noticed a couple of you had uh, told me you listened to my podcast. I think that might be the entire audience at some times, but I appreciate you saying that. Um, now I'd like to get into our uh, company presenters here.